everybody. This is Stephanie Ruper. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Naked Humanity podcast, where we do philosophy about us and try to figure out how to be happy and good in the modern world. Today is episode number 57, and I have on Alex Farrow, who is both a comedian and a teacher, and we talk about the intersections between philosophy and comedy and teaching. So this is a great episode. I'm super happy and excited to share it with you. A uh, quick aside uh, before I tell you about our chat, uh, I happened to mention to Alex when we got on the line that there are people in my life who call me Stefani, which there are. Uh, and so we unfold this chat as a conversation between Alex and Stefani. Uh, you may join him and some other people in my life in calling me that if you so wish. Uh, and yeah, that's now uh, another another piece to this Stephanie Stefani puzzle you have. Uh, to use to your liking. So about this chat that I have with Alex, I uh, I learned actually quite a bit. I just got off the line with Alex. I learned quite a bit about uh, the philosophy of humor. I learned about uh, comedy and um, how artful it is. And I learned about how uh, similar it is and what it feels like to be uh, someone who is on a stage and somebody who is teaching. And so Alex and I talk about, uh, we talk a little bit about his experience teaching and what he's learned from it and how uh, that has shaped his life and why that's important to him. And he studies philosophy. And so uh, there is sprinkled throughout the conversation, uh, philosophical tidbits. Um, And he also has a really uh, beautiful philosophical approach to teaching and comedy and why he does all of these things. And of course, uh, he is a great uh, dialogue partner. He is a great speaker because uh, because this is what he does uh, for a living. Uh, I actually I found uh, our our conversations. I ask some probing questions about like what is funny and uh, how, what is the relationship between offensiveness and funny or power and funny. And uh, we talk about those things in ways that I think are really important. You know, there are big questions in our world today about. Um, who we talk to and who we are friends with and who we listen to and who we think is funny. And should we think these people are funny and and why Alex takes uh, a view that I take and talks about on the podcast um, that we need to be talking with people who are, who are different from us, sometimes radically different. And uh, that always can be an experience for, for us to grow as uh, individuals and can help all of us grow as a society. So we talk about that and, uh, some funny things. And um, it's a really lovely uh, mix between uh, being deep and uh, being entertained, I think. So um, I do, I want to jump into it. Uh, Alex and I talk about where you can find his work at the end of the podcast. And I will put links uh, to his various social media profiles and stuff on uh, in the show notes. Uh, and you can find his work. He actually runs a comedy club of sorts here in Oxford. And uh, there's a tavern, a stone's throw from where I live called the Jericho Tavern, where he hosts a a comedy night uh, called, and it's all called uh, Jericho Comedy. So you can Google that or just uh, go to one of the links that I provide. So you can learn more if you want to consume any of his stuff, or if you happen to live in the UK and want to go to one of his shows. Uh, so thank you so much for tuning in. If you have questions about this, you can be in touch with Alex. You can be in touch with me. Uh, you can drop me DMs on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You can email me at stephanie at nakedhumanity.org, all of these different things. Um, so yes, thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in and get hype. Here is uh, the wondrous Alex Farrow. Hi, Alex. Hi, Stefani. Hi. Uh, it's it's so lovely to chat with you. Are you actually in Oxford? I am in. I am in Oxford. I am, I'm not in one of its uh, dreaming spires. I'm actually in my house. <laughs> okay. I mean, um, I'm in my laundry room, uh, which is exciting. It's important to do your laundry. Got to gotta have that happen. <laughs> yeah, very, very important. I mean, I could, um, a friend of mine was once like, wow, would you like philosophize anything? And I was like, yeah, give me just like two random words. And he was like, lettuce mm-hmm. conditioning. And I wrote like a dissertation on lettuce conditioning. So like we can philosophize about your laundry room if you want. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how much my t-shirts can really provide us with uh, <laughs> deep thoughts, but 
I think, I think, I think it, I think it's possible. I think it's there. So, um, do you, you do, you do comedy for a shtick. You also teach, you do both. So yeah, I've been a comedian for two years as a, as a job. Um, and before that I was a school teacher teaching in, um, high school in the UK. That's uh, secondary school. Um, mostly sort of 16 to 18 year olds, but down to, down to 11. Um, there's a lot of similarities between the two jobs. I think I get asked that a lot, sort of, um, being interesting in front of a group of people, hecklers and both, um, uh, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. That's very interesting. Where did one come before the other or have you always been into both? I got into comedy relatively late in the stand up game. I got into comedy in my sort of mid to late twenties, um, which is kind of, I suppose it's supposed to be quite late these days. I was a teacher from my early twenties. They were nice and vague. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, I've always liked teaching. I'll go back into teaching at some point, but um, comedy is really fun for now, definitely. That's, uh, yeah, that's really cool. So I actually went to one of your shows at the Jericho, yeah. at the Jericho mm-hmm. Tavern. Yeah. And um, just so you know, like I go to nothing. I go to nothing. <laughs> I, I, I could not care less. I can't be bothered when my friends go to musicals and stuff. They just, they know never ever to ask me because I won't go. But my friend Paul was like, look, there's this bro. He does philosophy. It's very <laughs> funny. And like, we have to go. And we didn't even get drunk and we thought it was great. So. Uh, well, that is, what a, what a, what a review. <laughs> Alex Farrow, I enjoyed him sober. Um. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. You're very, very welcome. Um, yeah. So, but you did, have you, your show that I went to was about teaching and was like it philosophical was, yeah. Yeah. and it went over, like everybody thought it was super funny. Do, does everybody always find it super funny or is it like, does the Oxford context make it a little easier? Uh, that particular show, uh, all about teaching philosophy in a school, it's, uh, you can, you can do something like that pretty much anywhere. Occasionally you get people who have just come for comedy, um, and you, they may or may not enjoy it. What's mm. so bizarre I find about comedy is you might see somebody in the street with a flyer and might hand you a flyer and be like, hey, come see my comedy night. And I always think, oh, well, what, what, what kind of comedy is it? What is it about? And they go, oh, well, it's, it's very funny. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's, that's great. But what, what's, it, <laughs> what's it about? Uh, I think it's really strange if you imagine it uh, with music. If somebody were flying in the street and say, hey, come see my music night. And you'd be like, oh, well, what, what is it? And they'd be like, oh, it's, it's very musical. <laughs> no, 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 but tell me about it. Like, oh, it, it sounds good. I think um, uh, comedy's come quite late to sort of specifying its kind of content and talking about kind of the different styles of it. Uh, mm. As you sort of allude to, um, uh, there's a definite, uh, it, there's a definite appeal to a show about philosophy. I did it in Newcastle relatively recently. Uh, I've done shows in Newcastle a lot, uh, about philosophy and not philosophy. Uh, they've gone well or badly. Um, mm-hmm. They've done both. And uh, the mum most recently, my um, my mum was very helpful and filled it with lots of my stepdad's former military colleagues. Oh, good. So I think they were they, they were expecting something a little bit different, I think. And uh, it wasn't quite to their taste, unfortunately. But uh, mm. it's, I, I'd hate it. I'd hate it for... Uh, one, one of my goals is to avoid the idea that philosophy... Um, should just be for a particular group of people, right? And obviously there's the kind of the Oxford connection, uh, which suggests that you'll only get certain jokes if you've read the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche, right? Mm -hmm. Jokes about Friedrich Nietzsche can be a bit of a niche. Um, But the idea is that nobody should have any uh, uh, prior knowledge kind of assumed, um, certainly in the type of comedy that I do. Stefani, I've got a a brief question to mention. I hope this isn't ruining it too much. Are you hearing a beeping coming from my computer? No. That's fantastic, then. I can hear that beeping, but that'll be not on the <laughs> podcast. But anyway, uh, the, the, great, the greater uh, point is that um, uh, one of the best things about fusing, I think, comedy and philosophy is that um, uh, comedy is a very open medium. It's very attractive to people. Um, people come and listen to ideas that they probably wouldn't necessarily listen to otherwise because of the comedic aspect. Um, and I'd hate it to be like an insider's club. I think mm. it's quite... It should be when it's done best, the opposite of it. That's how it started in ancient Greece and all that sort of stuff. And I think that's the way it should be done more so today. Yeah, me too, which is why I so much 
appreciate you and and other people like I have a colleague who writes limericks in in songs and really uh brilliant you know and fun poems uh that that are really thought provoking yeah and I'm just like relentlessly incapable and the best that I'm capable of doing is having these conversations with like a kind of accessible graphic at the beginning <laughs> like, <I> just, <laughs> um but it, but it's but it's it's so it's so important and I think a lot of you were talking about uh like Nietzsche and whether you have to understand Nietzsche and in this uh when I went to your show, uh, me and my friends and a handful of people in the rows around us, you had you had us like try to guess whether lyrics were like uh, from the Bible or from Nietzsche or from like Kanye or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. And like I don't, if everybody like there was some person giving answers, and he's a friend of mine. And <laughs> then the rest of us are like elbowing each other, like whispering about like <laughs> wrong bastard, you know, whatever. Um, and so I, I so much appreciate that you are that you're able to have those, you know, that you found a way and I don't, you make it seem effortless, but it's incredibly challenging in my opinion. Oh, uh, that's uh, very kind of you to say the, the point of some of those quizzes where I'd sort of read out either bits of philosophy or bits of like pop music or adverts sometimes is you, it's, you can't tell the difference. Sometimes you get lots of wisdom in lots of different places. The idea that there's a big difference between sort of high culture and low culture I think even when you do get like a smarty pants in Oxford, they can't necessarily tell the difference sometimes. And I think that's what's great about those quizzes. What's really funny. Yeah. I mean, I, I, one thing I almost never go to is talks around Oxford because I, I often feel like so much of this academic discourse that we have, people will say something for like 60 minutes or like 10,000 words or whatever, but you could capture it just as easily if you had like four sentences and yeah you know, or a song or something. Right. And so, um, it, I understand why that like kind of language is useful sometimes maybe. Um, but I, yeah, I like that you do that. Do you did, is that something you did with your students as well? Well, it's, it's definitely something you should aim for. Right. I mean, I, I, you know, I love to sing my praises and say, I always, <laughs> I always manage to make the most complex ideas <laughs> that are yeah, completely accessible. But, um, no, but uh, I mean, the, the thing about sort of trying to demonstrate that you get like the song of songs and, hmm. you know, hip hop can have like really similar, you know, would you have I, students look at that? Uh, I, I think uh, philosophy is best done uh, in the classroom when you've got lots of analogies, right? Examples of how it operates in the sort of real world and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah. So using those is, is so so important. I think um, I sort of do that in reverse in the in the show actually in that particular show that you saw and in my comedy in general. Like if, say if I'm talking about Socratic questions, you know, you have to demonstrate that sort of thing in order to get the idea. So mm. um, I often use conversations I've had with my students to then uh, illustrate complex philosophical ideas to an adult audience, which I think is, I think there's sort of a kind of a, a beautiful balance in that. Mm. Um, I seem to remember that there was like a, there were some lessons that we could take away from the show. I'm not hundred percent clear on what they were. Can you <laughs> well, remind failed. me? I failed in my job. <laughs> failed in my job. Um, I, I, there are a few of them. Um, one, uh, the, the philosophy itself was deeply important, I think, in teaching kind of an independence and like a questioning of authority, a, a very common structure throughout the interactions I have in that show. And then right at the end is the questioning authority is very important. Um, there's some realizations that I have at the end, uh, which I don't know, don't know whether they're too big of a <laughs> spoiler alert or whatever. Um, <laughs> I did have somebody, I wonder whether it was at that show or not. Um, I've had occasional um, times when there's definitely been some themes that have not been quite as explicit. Somebody once came up to me at the end and said, oh, I thought this show was going to be about Socrates, but all you did was tell stories where you were talking with your students. And I was like, oh, have you ever, have you ever read any uh, Plato? Uh, I talked about platonic dialogue. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's just conversations with his students. It's, that's, all that it, that's all that it is. He's like, Oh yeah, yeah, very, very good point, very good point. <laughs> but um, yeah, I kind of, uh, uh, I'm a big, yeah, big fan of uh, the ancient, uh, like Greeks, like a lot. Um, and mm. I think that we can learn a lot about 
uh, rhetoric and seeing through rhetoric. This, it touches on the political, particularly the stuff about sort of democracy, I think, and uh, I think democracies increasingly um, being questioned in the in the modern era. Um, and so those examples where my students said they wouldn't vote and stuff like that. I think um, that classroom is a microcosm for society as a whole. Um, and yeah, the idea that democracy is important, uh, independent thinking is important, and those things are genuinely under threat. It's a dialogue about dialogue. I suppose to be very pretentious about it. Mm, meta, yes. Um, <laughs> do you? So do you see? Um, do you see these two things as going hand in hand? The uh, democracy and the questioning of you know, philosophy or questioning of authority or or what have you? Yeah, I think uh, certainly in the UK, there's always a debate about um, whether things like philosophy and history and humanities are really like important. Um, And you have sometimes have the same person say, oh, I don't think things like philosophy are important. And in the same sort of breath, they'll say things like, uh, we don't have... uh, uh, people in this country who know how to like run a country or whatever we ask people to like vote but we never we never teach them about how to like critically analyze ideas or even have uh, uh like a polite debate um i think in the i sort of won't reveal my age too much but grew up on the cusp of the internet being in your pocket all the time and we're encouraged to comment and express an opinion more than ever but without but with fewer and fewer chances to know how to do that kind of well. Mm. Um, it, it's such an, it's such an automatic thought for me that that's so essential and it, and it doesn't come uh, immediately. When you teach younger students, you say, we're going to have a debate. They go, Oh, but I don't like arguing. And it's like, Oh, but it's, but it's a nice thing to do <laughs> to, mm. to argue and debate. And it's like, oh, but I don't like shouting at people. It's like, that's not that's not the point of an argument. That's not the point of a debate. And we sort of release these young people into the world, expecting um, them to be able to do good political discourse. But unless mm. you have it in microcosm at the school, I think you risk uh, you risk it going very badly. Mm. Yeah, that's very interesting. I didn't go to a UK school and so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to even come close to wondering what the you know the classrooms were like uh, but I can totally uh, understand what you mean you know especially if you're in classes where you're just like constantly being told things and in this culture in which we're like we're told to go out and have an opinion before we're told to go out and ask questions yeah. Um, yeah. and I, I find that to be particularly uh, inimical you know or, or problematic or, or whatever you know um, and so I am um, uh, yeah, I'm very, I'm very grateful for uh, that and teachers for that matter. Oh, very, very good. Is this, uh, what's the audience on this podcast? Is it mostly UK or pretty international? I'll, I'll try and use some American terms in there as well. Uh, uh I think they'll be able to get you. So don't worry. Oh, good. You know. good, good, good. <laughs> no, yeah. Um, I, uh, yeah, I brought, I brought a British friend to the States recently and he was like, uh, how do I communicate? And I was like, the same, you'll get it, you know? Um, yeah, um, um, a lot of Americans, but it's very international, so. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Um, all right, so that's um, that's really cool. I feel like something I remember you talking about was uh, how you're teaching the kids, but you feel like you learned a lot from them. Is there some? Is there a way in which the experience of teaching influenced your um, take on philosophy or uh, comedy for them. Uh, um, well, a huge amount for everything from sort of small examples. Um, uh, I think oh, gee, well, one of my favourite examples, I think, was I remember having a, a really excellent conversation with a student about the headscarf. Um, uh, I remember uh, being somewhat um, uh, ambiguous about how I felt about it, and I think uh, conversations with her. Uh, she was particularly good at using, I, teach, I taught her about the Socratic method a few sort of weeks before, and she really, really used it really well to sort of catch me out on it. Um, and uh, I remember she made a fantastic analogy about how there are all sorts of different coverings that different types of men and women wear, and uh, I, was, I turned out to be very inconsistent on why one type of covering might be bad, yet others uh, in some way, not ones that I noticed. I think she made a great analogy between um, a head covering and a, and a makeup covering. And I said, oh, I think the two are different. Um, so why are they different? I was like, well, one is because of the male gaze, which is a, a 
sometimes both because of the male gaze. I was like, uh, um, oh, uh, maybe. <laughs> and conversations like that were very, very, very good. That's um, mm-hmm. making me think a little bit differently. Mm. Yeah. Uh, others, uh, others in general, um, I've definitely uh, doing a bit of Descartes with students, I think was very good. Um, I think I had my opinion changed on that from a kid called Thomas a few years ago. That was, uh, that was very good. Um, I think he, uh, you know, the dreaming argument of Descartes? Um, can you explain it for all of us? Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, uh, Descartes says that in order to know anything, you must question everything first. He questions everything, 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 everything. And then um, uh, including this idea that, well, maybe I can't even be certain that anything that I see or hear is real because we can't tell the difference between um, dreams and, and being awake. And then he finally breaks out of this idea as well. I, I must know at least one thing that even if I'm dreaming, I have thoughts. Um, as he says, uh, the famous phrase in philosophy, I, I think dreaming, therefore at least I exist or whatever. And uh, this, I remember this kid going, oh, I, don't, I don't think that's true. I was like, well, I mean, I think that's you know, relatively certain. Why is it not true? And it's like, well, surely it's, um, I think, therefore, there are thoughts. You know, why do thoughts have to have owners? And I was like, what are you, what are you all about, Tom? This is, this is absolutely ridiculous. And he's like, well, surely we could be just a series of thoughts, one happening after another. Why do we think that there's an underlying self that exists them between them? And I was like, well, that's, um, that's an excellent point. And I'd never thought of it that way. And I, it really, it really flummoxed me. Um, and it's one of those great things about uh, students is because they've not read any philosophy sometimes, they just see it he was seeing it almost grammatically um, and you get that kind of fresh take on things, which you can lose. I think sometimes if you get really deep into any subject and a fresh look at it from an outsider, mm. um, particularly uh, a younger person who's got no sort of biases yet, I think is very good at every so often uh, breaking one out of uh, sort of thought traps. And that kind yeah. Of thing. Sure. That's like um, playing poker with somebody who's never played it before. Right. Yeah, like, that's a great analogy. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know all the rules and, and you're trying to play by the rules, but they're not playing by anybody's rules and all of a sudden they're winning and you're like, what's going on? <laughs> you're like, they don't know how to play this at all. They're, they're, they're betting way too early. I mean, they can't possibly have this card. Yeah. yeah. And then they wreck you. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, which is, it's, I think you're right. You know, that's, uh, that's very important and something that I'm constantly, you know, constantly... Um, aware of but I don't know we're all trapped in our own discourses so what are you going to do yeah I mean that was another thing that I think I've taken from teaching I've traveled a lot around the UK in very very different schools and yeah the bubble we live in completely different sort of worlds and I think that um uh things like democracy only really work where you talk and you have to talk like in person to people who have very different views like to you particularly in the show that you saw when I was teaching in East London some of the students had remarkably um unusual views about how society should be like constructed I remember one student said that he believed that young Muslims could only be free in a caliphate and I was like I, what, what does that what does that even mean um and breaking that like apart what he actually meant about that wasn't uh, half as scary as I thought it was um and you yeah, to meet people sort of face to face and to break down what those words mean. I've, I mean, for some of those students, I was a very strange um, sort of outsider and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I think it's so important to talk face to face to somebody who believes something different to you. Uh, I don't think I've ever done that and not understood so much more than reading through stuff, I think. I can't encourage it enough. You've got this projects on it in the UK, sort of deliberative democracy type things. I was reading about one recently when um, uh, sort of the issue of the day in the UK sort of um, leave or remain in Brexit. Every time you get um, uh, remainers and uh, leavers together in a, in a room, they always think they'll hate each other. I suppose sometimes it still does, but they're always so surprised at how much they can agree on. Um, I, I genuinely believe that if you can talk to somebody with the opposite view, it's always worth doing it if you can. I don't know. That, I, that seems that sh- it seems so basic, but I think that's really controversial. Now. I definitely have friends who believe the opposite, who believe the idea that I think you can pick up some of it from social psychology. There's lots of studies that suggest that people don't 
um, uh, change their minds based on sort of evidence, um, all sorts of like uh, ultimately kind of emotional animals. It's not uh, my experience at all. But I genuinely believe that people are very good at responding to others and thinking mm. clearly. You may you might disagree, Stefani. I don't know. We've there's definitely counter examples to that. But um, uh, no, I absolutely agree with you. As a matter of fact, my audience is probably like thinking like, oh, Steph brought this guy on just so he could like affirm everything she's always talking at us about. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I literally, I just recorded a podcast. Um, half of my podcasts are responses to listener questions. Oh, and uh, yeah, and somebody had written in and in the preface to their question, which was about something totally different entirely, was like, I'm pretty sure we're polar opposites. And mm-hmm. I was I was like, all right, hold up. Like, we're going to talk about this before we talk about anything else because it's. I think it's very easy. Well, a, I rarely, I don't often express views, but I think it's very easy to. We see difference before we see similarity. I think more more often than not, um, you know, and that's that's a very animal. You know, it's a very very human thing to do. But I think you're right. Like, I don't often encourage people to make sure that their encounters are face to face. But I, I mm-hmm. think you're correct that that makes it all that like I'm challenging people to see similarity but it makes it so much easier to see similarity when you're like oh we're humans who feel things together (laughs) um so yeah that's cool do you get that sense do you have that experience um when you're doing comedy as well as when you're teaching it's I'd love to say that that was the case I don't I'd love it if if particularly stand-up comedy was a medium that was very good at changing people's minds. I think one of the definitions of stand-up comedy probably shows that's not quite the truth. So I think the best definition of stand-up comedy I know as like, as opposed to say like a humorous theatrical monologue is that it's from Stuart Lee, who says that stand-up is a monologue disguised as a duologue. And so for the audience to enjoy it and laugh, it must feel like it's a conversation. So the, the performer will, will pause and respond to what's going in the room. But like ultimately, in a stand-up show, the vast majority of what's said is, um, is a monologue. If the performer's good, it doesn't feel that way. It feels like they're having a conversation with you. A good like comedy show will have an excellent host, an excellent MC, who does do genuine um, like discussion with the audience. But then once they're gone, it's made that way. It's created that fiction for the first, second, and third acts to perform essentially these monologues. Mm. And so because of that, it's much closer to the written word, I think, in terms of its power to change people's minds, I think. It's not to say that stand-up can't change people's minds and things like that, but it's not deliberative, it's not discursive in quite the way that, I think, before, a lot of people, before they go to stand-up shows, often presume that the, um, uh, that the performer makes it up on the spot. It's very rare, <laughs> and there are a handful that do that. And then you definitely get those people who will interrupt every sort of rhetorical question, every sort of setup, for example, is treated like a genuine question and they'll, and they'll sort of jump in. And they haven't quite understood the sort of fiction, the, the fiction that it's a, at root a monologue. And although the, a good comedian will go into the audience a lot to keep refreshing the idea that it's a discussion, it's not quite as good as that sort of face-to-face sort of thing. On In stand defence, though, uh, the definite um, dominant form of stand-up at the moment is very authentic. It's very first-person driven. It's very true. Audiences feel a real like connection with the truth of the person's story being told. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you do get that kind of overlap when the performer is being authentic to themselves and telling stuff from the personal perspective. Like 30 years ago, it wasn't that case. So now it's always, I did this, this happened, my mom, my dad, my, you know, and it's, that has a power to change people's minds in a way that um, if it weren't first person sort of authentic, that it mm. wouldn't. And I think that sort of thing is where, is an overlap that it does have with discussions ability to change people's minds. Sure. That's, uh, that's actually really fascinating to me by your, you know, saying about that authenticity. Um, I think we have, as a culture, like really valued authenticity for mm-hmm. a long time. Yeah. But um, so I have another gig or have had another gig oh, yeah. for um, a while as a health and nutrition influencer. Yeah. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, in my when I was in my master's mm-hmm. degree, I like figured out some health things and started talking about them and ended up growing a um, something that was very important to me. But I remember 
like how it's only been, it's been less than 10 years, but the, the way in which we market has significantly changed, right? There sort of used to be a, um, like you had to present yourself as like this perfect or idealized, you know, whatever. Um, but now I'm realizing that like, if you try to do that, people won't engage with you at all. Like you almost Mm -hmm. have to, you have to have elements. I mean, people are still lying all the time and you're right. Like you, you have a monologue and people have to listen to it because they're there and they paid to listen to you, you know, but there, there is a a sense in which I feel like, and I don't know if it's because of social media or what have you. um, The more and more I just like show up, right? Like social media posts, people are driving their cars or brushing their teeth. The more you just show up and seem like you're just like a human, um, the more people want to listen to you. And maybe that's also because we're so longing for like, authenticity or humanness because we actually don't encounter people in real life as much as we want to it's certainly so funny isn't it to see how um adverts are sort of kind of or selling of products has changed from that sort of early 20th century sort of 1950s stereotype like this toothpaste will clean your teeth it's good at cleaning your teeth do you have dirty teeth this will clean your teeth whereas you've got uh, a very different style uh, sort of now which is much like it's much more like do you want to be like this person this person uses this product. Do you want to live a kind of lifestyle where you have these children and this big house? These type of people have this toothpaste. Mm. But I think we're moving a little bit beyond that. And you see that in maybe for better or for worse, when you see sort of, um, I associate it a lot with Instagram and you'll have, um, uh, I think the right word is it, an influencer who will um, say, well, you know, I've just been given these products. I'm just a, a completely real person. I'm not an expert. I'm not um, selling you explicitly a lifestyle. I'm just an ordinary person just like you. And here's me experiencing it, like unboxing videos or whatever. Um, and that's an interesting way to see that it's gone so far from um, seven out of 10 doctors would recommend our foot cream. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are the other three doctors saying what, what's going on yeah although i mean to be honest like you know in some ways there is a like it's it's better because it's more authentic but i also just feel like it's maybe like even more lying because it's just gone deeper perhaps right like yeah. it's just more like manipulative you know or because you still have to you still have to be like, well, you have to fit in the like, well, this will give you a perfect life, right? This will solve all your problems somehow, right? It has to get in. Um, So anyway, we're getting away from comedy, but that's. uh, I think, but I think it's so true for stand up in in particular, right? That it's, there's definite exceptions to this. You've got the one liner comedians, you've got kind of sketch comedians, but all stand up is a, it's like a selling of yourself, right? And it's a massive overlap with uh, the, the new social media generation for whom like you are the product. When you click on somebody's YouTube channel, you, you're buying into them and, and their take. And what's on sale is authenticity, right? And so you get followers uh, as far as I can you know, see, I'm <laughs> just in the customer, all this sort of thing really, <laughs> but they, they love the person, right? And it's not what the person knows, it's not what the person does, right? And, it, and it's the same with um, comedians. Um, uh, and one of my favorite uh, comments at the moment is a lady called Chelsea Birkby. We gig together a lot. And um, uh, I think she'll be uh, much more successful and much more famous than I for this reason. We often have the same response, uh, a similar response at the end of a gig when we've both been gigging. Somebody will come up to me and say, hey, Alex, that was so funny. I, re- I really, that was really funny. It was really clever. I really liked that. And they'll turn to Chelsea and they'll go, I loved you. And it's different. She's made a type of... Her, she's so good at making a personal connection with audiences who mm. either see themselves in what she does. Uh, is it, and they often use that word, oh, I loved you. And so it's like, oh, you were very funny, Alex, but I loved you. Um, that's not to say that Chelsea's not funny. She was both funny, but she got so much more of herself out there. I think she's exceptionally skilled at that. Um, mm. Is that, is that something, do you, do you aspire like, do you want to do that for the sake of your career or because you want to, or is that something you're, you know, like, what is your I'd almost want the opposite. I know this, this is, this is bizarre. Maybe I can't explain it uh, enough. I would, I almost have the, uh, the goal that people uh, just love the material so much 
that I've written it so well, that I've crafted every single word, that it doesn't even matter almost who I am. They just can't help but like appreciate the, like, the craft, which is unhelpful because it's, it's not the way that it works. Um, but I'd love that idea. I love it when you see a comedian and they've done a joke and it just feels so sort of structurally perfect. It's almost as though that joke was kind of existing there and they discovered it rather than created it. I think that kind of skill, I think, is something that I aspire to, even though I know that if I were to open up even more about myself, it would probably be more financially viable. <laughs> but, um, uh, does, that even, does that make sense? I don't know yes. that you've got two, um, two things going on um, as a stand-up. You can sometimes, if you use too much craft, if it feels too written, you destroy some of that authenticity. Sometimes if it's all outpouring authenticity, then people are like, ah, but where's the jokes, where's the craft or whatever? And finding that kind of balance between the two, I think is really, really important. And actually probably Mm -hmm. something that somebody selling something on Instagram probably has to do as well. Yeah, I... um... I I think about that all the time and I am trying to get better at both or like, I mean, you can also portray yourself in a way that people don't connect with. Right. Like, (laughs) and sometimes your authentic self, people don't really like that much. And so what are you, what are you going to do then? Um, (laughs) Which is fundamentally my issue, but um, yeah, I know I, I find that very interesting and I, I really like what you said about the art of like writing jokes. I think that that's, I resonate with that and I find that gorgeous. And whenever I watch or think about comedy, I like, I will hear a sentence and I'm like, Oh, that's very interesting to me. Like, why did they leave in that word? Right. Yes. Like, because it, it is that precise. Yeah. Right. Um, and sometimes like you might take six words to say something when I know you could have chosen one and I'm like, well, it's yeah. why are they, you know, why is he taking a roundabout way to that? Um, and so there's something I, I there's such an art, to it. And I don't remember who, I don't know, no, everybody in the history of whatever has said it, but it, you know, writing 10,000 words is so much easier than making a beautiful 100 words, you know? Oh yes. Is it, is it, I'm going to say it's Mark Twain because it's always Mark Twain, isn't it? <laughs> He's got the famous quotation, isn't it? Um, Something apologies like for writing you a long letter, but I didn't have the time to write you a short one. <laughs> okay. Um, that, that's it's beautiful. Just, it's a beautiful expression. I've, I've claimed it's Mark Twain. I think so much is claimed to be Mark Twain, but it's not actually. Yeah, um, I, I haven't actually I haven't read it in any Mark Twain, but yeah. certainly the sentiment. I would have yes. written you a short letter, but I didn't. And and that's what you're doing as comedians, and is uh, like it, I get the sense that that's important to you. Is yeah. sort of does everybody sort of do you notice among comedians that there's the same level of attention to word selection and, and discourse and detail and stuff like that? You've definitely got. Um, I, don't, I think of it as a military analogy. I don't know. I don't know why, but you've got the snipers, and then you've got the sort of the carpet bombers. And so, um, if, if, the, if, the, if these are laughter bombs going off, I don't know why I'm using this. But um, <laughs> the sniper will pick every single word like so carefully, um, and it's it's a real like one shot like hit, um, and it's it's a definite art. I mean there's competitions to write the, the shortest jokes and stuff like that, almost like haikus and stuff like that. And then you've got um, uh, people who speak at a million miles an hour. It can often be very unstructured. They know where they'll finish, but they don't necessarily know the journey to getting it. It's a, something that I really love about stand-up, that so much of it is about rhythm and energy in a room. Um, and that idea of making it feel like a dialogue is to do with responding to the energy. It might be just the interest in the room or the laughter in the room. Um, and it's why it never quite works to do it to one person. Yeah, some comedians get it a lot. Oh, go on, tell us a joke, mate. And it's like, so it's a very different art to tell a joke just to one person, um, to telling a joke to 50, 100, 200 people, because mm. it's about responding to what's going on. There are some comedians who are so good at like whipping up energy in a room. They don't really even need to be talking about anything in particular. They're, just, they're so good at, with their sort of physicality and responding. I've seen. Um, uh, it's a comedian called Jim Owen who does an impression of a pigeon for a good I've seen him do it for a good four to five minutes there's hardly there's hardly any words like I promise you the audience is, is weeping absolutely weeping and it's it's tight it's almost like a clowning where he's responding to what's going on as uh, in the audience and he can just keep it going and going and going and going and that's like an energy thing and mm. it's the opposite to 
picking eight words to truly sort of eviscerate the idea of an apple or something. I don't know. Um, but yeah, there's and there's everything in between that. I think I, I find stand-up uh, endlessly fascinating as a sort of a, uh, an example in kind of group psychology mm-hmm. to see how uh, you feel it actually when you get on stage. In a, almost every comedian I know will say, it, you know, in the first ten seconds whether it's going to be audiences make a real snap judgment so 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 quickly. And to see a room that is uh, sort of being lost and a real pro comedian sort of take that back, it's absolutely fascinating to have to quickly decide, right, why have they been lost? Is it too political, too rude? Do they not get where I'm I'm at? Is it, does this this sound right? Am I speaking too quickly? Mm -hmm. Uh, Do I need to reset the tone from something powerful later? Am I not being silly enough? It's absolutely fascinating. It's why, although it's not a very good... Uh, like show artistically it's why the gong the comedy gong shows are so fascinating do you know what a comedy gong show is it's uh essentially it's a heckle night and so the idea is to try and beat the five minutes um and it's a very sort of um combative audience trying to heckle to get you off and you have to sort of try and beat that in a way uh there's often um uh, people who have red cards who can mm-hmm. red card you sort of off and the it's fascinating to see how initially someone with a red card might be liking something, but will respond to a crowd being like, off, off, off. And the, the crowd will heckle itself. And to see the um, comedian intervene with that. I've, and you, you get these sort of kind of, um, I've seen, I have to give it like a sort of a Zen sort of jujitsu move when I've seen a comedian be like, yeah, no, no, you should card me. No, 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 card me or whatever. And the, and the comedian was asking to be carded off. And obviously they managed to last the five minutes because that was so sort of absurd or whatever. But those kind of managing a sort of a crowd response. Like, no, no, he was, I was like, I hate myself too. This is awful. And it was a very a clever use of that energy to turn itself back on itself. Mm. Yeah. And I I can imagine that there are some things that some people would find funny sometimes, but because you're in a group of people that like where more people don't find it funny, you don't find it funny because things are funny when they're funny to everybody. What's really fascinating is seeing groups of friends or particularly couples. um, And you can see who holds power with it. It can sometimes be on a date. Sometimes it's not necessarily the, the, the best thing socially in the world, but it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. You'll often see you do a joke sometimes and then one of a couple will just look to the other. And if the, and if the other member of the couple is laughing, they'll come back and then they'll laugh. They will check in every time. Uh, Groups of lads will do it. Sometimes you can work out who the alpha in that group is. So they'll check in Mm -hmm. the alpha, all that sort of stuff. It's not normally the loudest person in that group, but they'll always sort of check in to see if the key friend is laughing. Um, And that's really, really fascinating. And then you work out quite quickly that there are key people in an audience that you need to hit in order to uh, turn a gig if a gig's not going your way. Um, And that's, um, uh, we've talked about the similarity between sort of teaching and comedy. In a difficult class, in a real rebellious class, I remember a German teacher visited my school once and um, I was half struggling as 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 a new teacher. And he came up to me afterwards and he was like, uh, I'll, I'll do the accent as best I can. He's like, Alex, you need to cut the alpha. I was like, what? <laughs> he talked about this kid who, quiet at the back or whatever, uh, wasn't actually interrupting. It's like, but they're all checking in with him. He doesn't like your lesson. You need to either get him out um, or talk to him about his behavior. He's the ringleader. I'm like, but he was well behaved. No, they were all checking in with him for his approval when they were talking over you. You need to deal with him, not the loud boys. And that's such a similarity between uh, teaching, comedy, crowd psychology, and some of the philosophy that I learned at school. Uh, well, I find, yeah, it's, and I find it endlessly fascinating. Yeah, I, I find that fascinating. There's this um, a, a big piece of the like the quote unquote work that I do is trying to invert this perception we have that like we have thoughts and emotions and they come from the bottom up uh, yes. into sort of understanding that like emotions are a float in the air and they like, <laughs> we're like vessels, you know, that like inhabit them. And I, I love the way that um, people who are on stages, public speakers, comedians or whatever, and I'm trying to learn how to be a public public speaker. And it's so much harder than you think because you have to be able to like know how to, you know, you're like a conductor almost of a yes. orchestra. Yeah. 
Um, I, I like that. I like that analogy a lot. I'm thinking about something and I think it's a very big question, but I'm so interested in what you think. And I'm sorry if people ask you this all the time, yeah, um, but I'm wondering what is funny. As in a definition of, uh, of, of humor and stuff like that. The philosophy, the philosophy of humor is, is fascinating. I think before I started thinking about it, I think I probably confused uh, laughter with humor. Um, and actually, uh, when you think about it, all sorts of laughter has got nothing to do with um, humor at all. Um, I think I once looked at a study on it and watch a conversation if you're next to the cafe and watching two people talk. Most laughter isn't in response to anything that we might consider a joke or humorous at all. It's, uh, it, it has a different sort of um, sociological function. It's an agreement. Most laughter in a, in a conversation will be like, oh, I agree with that. Um, the most common time a person will laugh in a day is when somebody says hello, um, apparently. And I really believe that. And I watch it. Someone say hello. And you're like, oh, hello. And, it, and it, it, it's, you've done it there. You've, you've, you've laughed as a form of agreement. I've not done or said something <laughs> that is a, tr- like a, a joke or humorous in any, in, in any way. But it's uh, laughter's got these two uh, evolutionary sort of functions, um, I think. Uh, one is it's a, a method for... Uh, reducing aggression and so the closest thing in the animal kingdom to uh, laughter that we kind of know of is probably something called open mouth play in chimpanzees Um, if you tickle a chip it'll go you probably can't see this if this is audio but it'll open its mouth very very wide it won't necessarily make noise if you tickle it but it will jiggle up and down and it'll have its mouth open Um, and the thought is that it's the opposite of closed teeth um, if you open your mouth, you can't bear your teeth if you make an O noise or whatever. And so it's a way of reducing aggression. If bearing your teeth in chimpanzees is a way of uh, heightening aggression, to open it is to show the opposite. And so laughter evolves as a way of showing to other human beings that something's okay um, and it's an aggression reducer. There's another uh, evolutionary sort of cause for laughter that's much more tightly associated with what we might call humor which is a kind of pattern recognition um and so whenever you laugh at something it's often uh, when it's a joke something surprising or incongruous has happened it's a juxtaposition between two different things and the idea i suppose is that that evolves um as a sort of a byproduct of our brain when our brain is looking for pattern recognitions in the rest of like the world that's the way that we invent things and it's a way of rewarding our brain when it's thinking when it's spotted a connection between two things that shouldn't be connected and so one of the definitions of of what humor is is it's uh, it's called the incongruity theory every joke everything humorous rests on the idea that there are two things that are linked it could be setup and punchline or it could be funny picture and serious politician two things that are in some way connected but you don't expect them to be connected. There's a connection underneath what you'd imagine. Your brain quickly spots it. These two things are incongruous and laughter and humor is the reward for that. Uh, it would be, I, 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 you must interrupt, otherwise I'll give you a whole sort of history of what kind of what humor and, and comedy is. But I think it's very interesting that laughter and comedy aren't necessarily uh, related. You know, people laugh at horror. Actually, which is a very dark thought. Um, when uh, people see horrifying things, actually, uh, they'll laugh. Um, when people see people um, injured, actually, often they'll laugh. Um, and that's to do with shock and, and horror. That's not being caused by humor when it's particularly nasty. Although people falling over is also very funny. <laughs> um, but it's funny when they don't really hurt themselves or they hurt themselves in a way that recovers. Uh, th- uh, people will laugh. Uh, there were stories in the, um, uh, the the French terror of the revolution where people would laugh at the guillotine, uh, laugh maniacally, like couldn't stop. Um, they don't find the situation funny, but it's a physiological uh, response to the horror of what's going on. And it's much closer to do with that first definition of what causes laughter, the idea that they want something to be okay. They're trying to communicate that it's okay, but it's not, um, mm. uh, which I think is fascinating. There's yeah. a really interesting third theory of what humor is as well, but I, I, maybe I'll stop there. But, but. No, I want to hear it. I, um, I, I mean, I could, I could, li- I could listen to this for ages because it's, it's a lot of stuff that I don't know about, but it's very um, fascinating. And yeah, uh, what's the third theory? 
The third theory is uh, Freudian kind of related, um, but they're sort of Freudian. Yeah, Freud wrote a whole uh, book uh, about jokes and the relation to the subconscious. Fascinating book. Some of it's just as mad as you'd expect from Freud, but there's something interesting that he does kind of gather. There's a sort of 19th century idea that we have, uh, like, uh, it's meant quite literally, like an energy inside of the body, and that uh, throughout the day we sort of repress it. We push down um, this energy. Uh, we push down our sexual urges. We push down our aggressive urges um, because we're not supposed to do that. We have all these um, things associated with our, our, our id, um, our sort of uh, deep emotional self. We push them down. And Freud says the reason that we find sexual jokes so funny, the reasons that jokes are often people being like hurt, the reason that jokes are quite dark a lot of the time um, is because that energy that repression is literally physically coming like out of us of ourselves laughter um uh, thomas hobbes is a, a, a way of describing it i think he says that laughter is the expulsion of glory from the body and so uh, he thinks of laughter as being particularly when we're laughing at dark things um we've got this he doesn't use the word repression he's writing before that kind of uh, psychoanalytic terminology but there's this thing inside you and laughter is like getting it out. He seems, Thomas Hobbes seems to think that all laughter is from um, like bullying. He seems to kind of conflate the two. Descartes seems to as well, actually, seems to think that um, laughter and humour is to do with um, uh, like teasing and sort of roasting and that sort of stuff. And so that when you laugh, it's always at the expense of somebody else. Um, mm. They give us a theory that we sort of colloquial, colloquially term that every joke has a victim. Um, I don't think that's true, actually, but some people really defend it uh, very, very strongly. And they say the real meaning of humour is actually closer to what I was saying that it wasn't in the beginning. And it's to do with our chimpanzee selves having a, uh, a structure in society and that when you do things like open mouth play or laughter, you're submitting to another, you're submitting to a dominant chimp and that there's always a victim to a joke and it's about power, it's, laughter is always about um, establishing a uh, structure, somebody who's in on the joke, outside of the joke, a winner and a, and a loser. Um, you might have heard of the phrase punching up and punching down, that uh, we want, to, the punchline must always punch in some way, and the mm -hmm. audience is like it when they feel like it's punching up to somebody with more power, because then they feel comfortable with that person being a victim uh, of the joke, Whereas if you're punching down, that's to somebody weaker than you, they feel uncomfortable with it. People are, are really obsessed with power in jokes. But I think anybody who's ever laughed at a knock-knock joke, um, uh, it, it's true, some people do, it's very hard to imagine whether, whether power is in there. Uh, often it's our attention and all that sort of stuff. Knock, knock, what's that? Power. I mean, I mean it's, not, <laughs> um, it's not how those jokes work. And I think, I think they're still funny. Um, right. Oh, simple, simple, playful humour, I think, doesn't have um, a victim in that sense, I think. Um, and it's still funny. So that theory of humour, uh, described by Thomas Hobbes and Descartes, and sort of alluded to by um, uh, Freud, uh, I think is, isn't quite right, that jokes don't have to be dark, although they are very funny when they are. Yeah. Um, all right. I'll ask you one more question, but you don't have to answer it if you don't want to, because it's political. But if you want to, if you want to weigh in, please weigh in. And on, on, I, I get the sense that there's a lot of tension in comedy these days in terms of yeah. like, should you be making fun of people? Right. Like it's, yeah, I think it's a part of these ideas about power. Right. And um, I'm wondering if you think that like, continuing to hold space for people say making jokes based on race or class or gender or yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. Um, is appropriate or if it's something that we need to like stop doing you know or is it possible to create jokes that don't offend people oh uh you, you've sort of alluded to the answer to that it's impossible to make any kind of comment that no one anywhere won't take issue with i think a couple of things uh, i think about it it's I don't think there's necessarily any topic that is off limits, but there's some that I'm not skilled enough to do. There's some topics that uh, I know I can't handle. Um, and like rightly so, if I'm uh, 
talking about gender and race and all that sort of stuff, I have to be so much more careful, I think, than somebody speaking from um, a traditionally, um, a group that's been traditionally uh, uh, less powerful in those spheres. Um, and so I don't think any topic is necessarily off limits, but you have to be so much more careful in how you use it. Um, that's something that I've learned by watching a lot of comedians. I think it's almost any idea can be made humorous if it's clever enough in its treatment and mm. true enough and authentic enough. And if you've understood your audience, there's no such thing as a joke without an audience, like a tree falling in the forest if nobody hears it. Like a joke that's appropriate in a comedy club is very different to a joke amongst friends. Um, and so anything can be done. So long as the person is super good, <laughs> is yeah. the is the uh, kind of the answer to that. I think. Yeah, um, that's, uh, that's interesting. So there's like you're saying the topics can be treated, but also yeah. like you know, uh, punching down uh, yeah. maybe used to be more popular than it is today, right? And in, in... Uh, sort of, and so I, it might be that our definition of what is and what isn't punching down has changed, right? So I think uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, jokes that we might consider now punching down uh, but just weren't considered that then so the principle mm. was probably true back then um interesting yeah. but uh where that line is probably moves i don't is would be my guess on it but um i'm, I'm sure listeners of your series and podcast can message in their <laughs> objections to that but um no, that's actually, that's very uh, helpful. And uh, you've, you've actually, you've given me a lot to think about. So I'm going to let you go. Um, oh. I'm wondering, A, <laughs> for, <laughs> for the podcast recording, uh, A, I'm going to uh, ask if you have anything else you want to share. And B, um, oh, yeah. can, you, can you tell people like how to find you and your stuff? Ah, yeah, uh, I've, got, I've got sort of two, maybe three main projects. Um, one of the best things I've ever done is... Uh, uh, my comedy club, Jericho Comedy, raises money for uh, Oxygen Mind. It's got its own um, uh, radio show that you can listen to on Thursdays at um, 10 p.m. on Union Jack Radio. And you can listen to me uh, having that dialogue that we talk to with an audience. I'm the host of it. So you can hear me doing that. You can hear me having a true dialogue with the audience there. Is Sorry, um, uh, Union Jack Radio, is that like an actual radio station in the UK? It is. Uh, if you were to Google it, 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 you can, it's on the internet. Google, uh, okay. Is, is, is why I mentioned. If you Google, um, if you Google Jericho Comedy, um, Union Jack Radio, uh, you will hear me every Thursday. And it's a broadcast rather than a podcast, which is old school. Um, if you want to uh, listen to what I do, probably follow me on Twitter. I'll pop up clips every so often and sort of where I am and what I'm doing. I'm uh, Oh, God, where am I? I'm Alex underscore Farrow. It's the easiest way to find me. You can tweet me all your opinions on how I was wrong in this podcast. Um, <laughs> I was yeah, complacing yeah. Uh, Thomas Hobson and uh, Freud in a way that I'm sure there would be some academics who were like, I think their theory of humour is entirely different. I'm, a, I'm aware that some people think it's entirely different. I think there's some overlaps. Uh, fortunately, I'm pretty sure there's no uh, Hobbes scholars listening to this podcast. I wouldn't like mm -hmm. I wouldn't put all my money on it, but I put a fair amount of money mm -hmm. on it. So, but not yet. This someday, hopefully. Um, yeah, that's that's very great. Um, please do direct your questions to him. You're not on Instagram, are you? No, I am on Instagram as well. Actually, it's, um, uh, frustratingly, I'm, I have a different Instagram name. I'm Alexander Farrow One because uh -huh. my social media game is weak. But if you type in Alex Farrow on Instagram, you'll probably find me anyway. You know, you can change that, right? Okay, we can. <laughs> I, there's so many. I don't. My name's not unique enough. Alex Farrow's mm. gone. There's another Alex Farrow on Instagram. He's not a comedian. Yeah. You worked that out quite quickly. Um, <laughs> I did. Uh, when oh, I was yeah. when I was at your show, I made a story for Instagram. Oh, and I, yeah. I couldn't. I know I couldn't tag you. Um, yeah, you got to be a Stefani or something. Then you're and then you're in That's the clear. Such a good name. <laughs> <laughs> um okay cool so find uh, alex probably on twitter um and you my instagram is very funny as well so if you if you can if you're clever enough to find my instagram you deserve to, to deserve the content okay good okay <laughs> i uh i will challenge myself when we hang up to go do that um get at him uh don't get at me you can always do oh, that though <laughs> <laughs> um 
And uh, yeah, everybody knows where to find me. So um, thank you so much, everybody, for oh, tuning pleasure. in. And thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. Fun. Yeah. Um, okay, take care. I will be back next week. Thank you.